glad to have you here. We'll go through this. Hopefully it won't drag on too long. I think 1.30 is when we're done. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview of the local government program first, and then we'll talk about our toolkit. We really think this is a tool that actually has value for TxDOT-led projects too, for people to work on not just tech, uh, local government managed projects, but also TxDOT ones. Our definition of a local government project is one where at least one phase of project development is being managed by a local government agency, and they're getting reimbursed with federal FHWA or TxDOT funds on that particular project. We also call a project that's even if it's 100% local funds, but it's on the state highway system, that we also want to track it as a local government project within TxDOT because TxDOT takes over maintenance responsibility of that project when it's done. So we want to be sure that they construct it properly. The various phases of project development we're talking about are shown on the bottom of the slide up here. The different types of local governments that may have projects with us where they get reimbursed with state or federal funds are shown on the slide. It's a wide variety of entities. They all have their own governance structure, their own approval process, and so it does get relatively complicated to know with each entity who is the decision maker who you need to talk to to work with you on your projects. Currently, as of September 1st, there's about 900 active local government projects that meet the definition I just presented for non-toll en entities. Of those, there's about $3.4 billion in total project cost. The 38% of is federal funding through FHWA, about 5% is state, and about 57% of that is local funding. And of those 900 projects, about 400 of them are actually led by the local entities. Those may be projects that are currently in construction or other projects that are somewhere earlier in the project development process, but of all the 900, about 400 of those will be let locally by a local entity, and that totals about $1.8 billion in project cost. Um, there's also approximately 40 projects that local toll entities have responsibility for. Those total about $3.7 billion in total construction value. Of that, only about 5% includes federal funds, 13% tech stop funds, and 82% of those toll projects is local dollars put in by the local toll entity. Of those 40 projects, about 30 of those are local let projects. Again, the toll entity in those cases will be letting those projects and the construction cost of all those projects is about $1.8 billion. Currently, 24 of the 25 districts have something that's considered a local government project. That may be they have a consultant working for a local entity doing the plans for their project, and it's gonna be text outlet in some of the more rural districts, or the Mopac Expressway project in our coal lane project down in Austin that the CTRMA is doing, those are also the extremes pretty much of the types of local government projects that we could have. Throughout the state as of September, there's about 200 different local entities that have local government contracts and local government projects with TxDOT. Some of those entities obviously have multiple contracts, other ones may only have one and may only have one every several years. Typically in all of these contracts, TxDOT's participation is on a reimbursement basis. That's where the local government actually has to spend the money either for their consultants or their contractor, pay them, and then seek reimbursement from TxDOT. We reimburse them if they follow the rules and give us the proper documentation that they did it properly. And then after we pay them, we seek reimbursement from FHWA for any federal funds that are involved in that project. So some of the local government responsibilities that they may have, and this again is up to the district to determine if the local government has the capabilities to perform these functions before we sign a funding agreement with them. But the different areas that they may have responsibility for is one or any of the ones listed here. And so various phases in the preliminary engineering phase and other phases during construction all the way through project closeout. Again, only if they're being reimbursed with state or federal funds does it count as a local government project. If they're doing this with their own funds, then it doesn't fall into the category of a local government project. TxDOT's responsibilities are to maintain oversight of them and to make sure that the projects are managed, developed, and constructed in accordance with applicable laws, regulations, policies, and procedures. Earlier this morning, Mo talked about the uh, project lists and the portfolio that the districts have to manage. Well, whether the districts like it or not, local government projects are part of their portfolio. Even though they have less direct control over the 
actions by the local government because it's a local government contract with their consultant or their contractor and TxDOT's only providing oversight. So TxDOT also has to have adequate uh, procedures in place to oversee the local government and to help them through the process in a timely manner so that the district can manage the portfolio of all their projects, including the locally government projects. Within TxDOT, the way the responsibilities are delegated or distributed is the districts have the responsibility of the primary point of contact with the local governments, and they're the ones responsible to monitor the performance of the local government for fulfilling the requirements under their agreements. The local government project office, of which I'm a part, our responsibility is to develop standardized policies and procedures and distribute those to the districts and to train local government entities on that. So we also provide training classes. <laughs> we provide guidance and advice and support to the districts as needed, and we also uh, monitor the districts. So we travel to the districts to review projects and how their performance is going and to assist them as necessary. And then we're the primary point of contact with FHWA on local government projects. They call it the Local Public Agency Program, or LPA program is the federal highway term. In Texas, we call it local government projects because we have a local government code that relates to these local government entities. The divisions and offices, in addition to local government project office, their role is to provide technical experts and resources and subject matter experts if needed. Since we don't have expertise on bridge design or on traffic operations, we as a local government project help the districts by putting them in contact with the right people in the divisions and districts to get assistance when they have a specific need on a local government managed project. We do want to remind everybody that on these projects, even though TxDOT is not the owner of the project, we have oversight responsibility that is done in a safe manner as well. And so we have to make sure their contractors, that their consultants design the project so it can be performed safely, and that we do have responsibility to go out periodic periodically, review their traffic control plans, see if their barricades and everything are in order. So even though we're not directly managing it, the funding is coming through us and we still have a safety <coughs> responsibility and need to be sure that the construction sites are safe for the traveling public, for the construction workers, for the local government's employees and their consultants, as well as our textile employees that travel on that work site. So what are some of the tools and resources available to TxDOT and to the local government entity to help us manage these projects? And what are the things to assist TxDOT in ensuring they're actually complying with the work and the requirements that they're supposed to follow? Earlier this year in June, the Local Government Project Office uh, released some new tools that are available on the internet site, which I'll show you momentarily. And it's set up on a single website. You go to TxDOT.gov, and I'll show you where, that, where to access that. So that the local government, their consultants, the public, anybody can find this website and use it. It has three major elements in it. We have a policy manual, which basically tells you why you have to do something. What is the federal state law or regulation that tells me I have to do what you're telling me I have to do, or what do I have to comply with? We also have a separate manual called the project, or document called the project management guide, and it, we consider that the what document. It's the procedure, the recommended process to go through to be successful in delivering the projects. And we also have developed a project workbook which is for an individual project that is about 60 pages long and it basically guides you through step by step which has checklists um, and other documents in standard forms to help you actually implement an individual project and keep some of the project records on that project. There are direct links between the documents and within the documents and also from these documents there are direct links to external resources including laws, regulations, other people's websites and textiles websites. The email address is down at the bottom, I mean the, the web address is at the bottom, but I'll show you in a moment how to access it so you don't have to memorize that little address down there. The entire set of tools are organized the same way and they're organized to follow the project development process, the various steps to be done through a process. You start with project initiation on the left and you work your way through project closeout on the far right. This includes also non-construction type projects. There are corridor studies, access management studies, there are other types of projects that we have agreements with local governments to produce for us where they get reimbursed with state or federal funds, and some of them don't involve construction, and so we have sections on that to talk about how you manage non-construction projects. 
for construction projects or projects that will move into construction, you have environmental requirements and right away utility issues that are con go on consistently throughout the process. As we learned or was discussed earlier this morning, the desire is to have your right away cleared, utilities all relocated before you start construction. We all know that doesn't always happen, but this goes through and again shows the local government recommended ways to go through and get those things accomplished before they start construction, but they do continue on beyond that. As an example, some utilities, if it's owned by the same entity as the local government, if it's a city with their own water and sewer system, they're probably gonna relocate those as a part of the construction project rather than do it separately in front of the project. Also, there's environmental commitments made during the development of the plans and project approval that have to be monitored through construction and sometimes even monitored after construction. If you're establishing a wetland or something else, you have to make sure it's still uh, serving its intended purpose for months or years after the project is over. So those are the, the chevrons on the bottom are the environmental right away because they go through many phases of the project. And then the main bar in the middle from project initiation, you go into preliminary engineering and design, ps and &E development, letting in award, construction, and then to project closeout. So again, the manual, the guide, and the workbook all follow this project development process. At the bottom, you can see we have a link that also shows you some flow charts for each of these to explain in more detail what the actual steps are, what the local government's responsibilities and actions are, and what tech sets are, and I'll show you those in a few minutes when I go onto the website as well. So what are some of the things that TechSot actually has as tools to manage the local government to make sure they're following the process? What are the checkpoints along the way that they have to accomplish that we have authority and responsibility to verify that they've completed those tasks? Um, I'll go into these in a little bit of detail, mostly an overview here, but all of these steps that we're talking about, these 10 steps, have specific information in all of our documents to show what the local government's responsibility is, what TechSot's responsibility is, and what are the requirements to actually complete that step properly. But TechSTOT has the responsibility to issue a state letter of authority to authorize the local government to begin the engineering work because they can't get reimbursed for it if we don't have a signed agreement and we haven't given them written notice to start incurring costs. So that's a checkpoint that we have, that we don't have to issue that until we're confident that they have the ability to proceed and know what their responsibilities are. We also have the responsibility to approve their proposed consultant services procurement contract or cons consultant selection process before they actually start selecting it. Unfortunately, there are many local governments that forget this step and go out and do it and then come back and say, oh, well, is what we did okay? Well, we need to be working to all the local governments to understand, submit it to us first because there are specific federal and state requirements because you're using our money that you have to follow. If you don't follow them, then you can't get reimbursed for it, even if your agreement says you can. One of them is the local preference, is that you can't have only contractors that have done work for your city be qualified to do work for your city under these federally funded projects. It has to be open to anybody that's qualified to do that kind of work. So again, that's another step that TechSot has where we get to approve before they start the consultant selection process. Whenever they're gonna submit an invoice to get reimbursed for those consult services, we have to review and approve that they actually did the work it appears to be progressing and that, that reimbursement for that is appropriate. TechSot also provides approval of their environmental documents. Even before we got delegation from um, FHWA on the environmental documents, we still had to approve them before we submitted them to FHWA. So that's another point of responsibility and authority that TechSot has to manage these contracts to make sure the consultants working for the local government are doing things properly. TechSot also, if they're required to purchase any right away or relocate utilities, we also have the responsibility to issue them a letter of authority to proceed with that acquisition as well or relocation of utilities. So again, another place along the way that we have the ability to tell the local government stop, we don't think you're doing it correctly, we're not gonna let you start this step till we fix the things that have been done so far. TechSat also has the responsibility to approve the final plan specification and estimate to verify that it meets our requirements or the federal requirements that apply. And this again applies if it's a local government providing all the money for construction but it's on our facility, we need to 
through the plans and specifications because we take over maintenance responsibility for that facility once it's been built. A few other things we have is that after we've approved the PSE and seen that the, re the railroad uh, agreements, if there are any, are in place and they've certified that to us, as well as the utilities are relocated or they've defined what the steps are to get those final utilities relocated and the right of way, if there is any then we issue a state letter of authority to allow them to actually advertise for construction. They can't start advertising for construction before we give them authorization. Most local governments uh, don't do electronic bidding. The state of Texas right now for most local government entities requires them to actually publish official notice in a newspaper. Um, they're not required to do it as long in advance as the federal government is, but the federal government requires it to be 21 days in advance of the letting day. And so those are the kinds of things that are defined in all of our documents to help them understand what the various criteria are which applies to their particular project. And TxDOT having access to that helps us better oversee and make sure they're complying with the rules. After they've received their bids, they have to tabulate them and submit them to TxDOT, and then we actually have to concur an award before they're allowed to execute their contract with their contractor. Again, another checkpoint to give TxDOT ability to manage the local government TxDOT also has to approve any reimbursement requests. We don't approve them to pay their contractor, their invoice to their contractor, but we don't reimburse them for that until we've gone through and verified that they've given us appropriate documentation and that we have confidence that they're following the appropriate rules and requirements. To do that, we need to go out and take site visits on a periodic basis. We need to review the project documentation. We can't just sit in the office and expect them to send us an invoice and have all the backup information for us to feel comfortable that they're following all the rules. We as TxDOT employees, either the area office, the district office, or someone need to go out physically and see the project at various times. We actually encourage the districts and local governments to meet every month and that the district or an area office person accompanies the local government when they review the project progress for their contractor before they get the invoice each month. We know that doesn't always happen, but we think it'd be a lot simpler if everybody met together and agreed on what was done and then they submitted the invoice to the local government and then we already know that when they, the local government submits the reimbursement to us, that we've already seen the work's been done and so we can approve it. But it does require commitment and time on the district staff or area office staff on a monthly basis. TxDOT also has to give final inspection of the project at the end and to review all the documentation to verify that it's all complete then the local government needs to retain their records for at least three years after the project's complete. And the very last step is TxDOT prepares a statement of cost where we actually look at the amount of costs we incurred during the project, the amount of local participation that was supposed to be made towards construction and consult services, and then we tell the local government if the amount of money they deposited with us at the beginning covers all those costs or if they owe us more money or if we actually had them deposit greater funds than we had took to actually manage it, then we send them a check back along with a statement of cost to say, you put in $50,000 and only cost 43, here's $7,000 back. So those are the controls, some of the controls at a high level that TxDOT has to verify that these projects are done in compliance with all applicable rules and regulations. I'm gonna go to the website now just to show you a brief demonstration of where the tools are. Um, just Everybody knows where TxDOT.gov website is? Anybody doesn't know where that is? Now get your notepad out, because this will be complicated. Does anybody see a government box in the middle with a big state of Texas star on it? If you click on that box, on the very next page, <coughs> under the processes and procedures, the very first bullet is Local Government Projects Toolkit. Did everybody get that, two steps? <laughs> Don, you got it? Okay. Just check. So on the website, there's actually 41 different slides that actually walk you through at a high level the various steps in the project development process, and then it has links to other, other resources that are available to you, including the manual, the guide, and the workbook. There's a brief description of what we just went through here about the three different documents and the same diagram that shows how they're interconnected and used.
you click anywhere on this diagram, this is just a static diagram, it doesn't matter where you click, or if you click on the button, pull it down below, it takes you to the next page which shows you a diagram that looks strangely similar to the process diagram I talked to you about before. Uh, from this page, we have a bullet for each of the different phases of the project development project from project initiation through project closeout and maintenance. And so this then takes you and gives you a brief overview of what the responsibilities are in those various phases. And I'll show you in just a moment some more information on there. But also we have up under forms and publications, there's some other tools here. And this is where the, well, I don't know what I did there. Under the frequently, actually, the project policy manual, if you want to print out and download a whole version or save it on your computer rather than go to the internet to get it, you can download the policy manual, the project management guide, and the workbook documents directly from here. The policy manual actually is a text.online manual, which is available through the online manual system as well. The online manual is the only document that requires FHWA approval that it's a document that's a controlled document between TxOP and FHWA. These all used to be included in what was the Local Government Project Procedures document, which included policies and procedures. But then anytime we wanted to modify our procedures, we had to go back and get FHWA approval of it because it was in the same document. At this point in time, we have separated those, so the policies are the only thing FHWA has to review, and we don't have policy changes as frequently as we desire to change our procedures. But in here, under the frequently formed or frequently used forms and documents, the first items up here, which are very valuable tools for the project management, we have flowcharts. For the various phases we just talked about. As an example, if we go under the environmental compliance area. Let's see how well this works. And I'll blow it up so you can see part of this because I know it's very difficult to see back there. But there's actually three bands on each of these flow charts. The green band is the local government's actions. The blue band is TxDOT actions. And down below that is a band for FHWA actions and responsibilities. And so as you go through the environmental process, there are vertical lines between TxDOT and the local government talking about where you should talk to each other. There are diamond shapes where TxDOT either approves or disapproves something. And then there are, <coughs> at the end, and in some cases, if it's not approved, it takes you back to what you have to start and do over again to get completed and to have approval at the end. And in the TxDOT line, you'll see that the boxes are different shaded colors on the actual corner of the form, there's a legend that actually tells you what part of TxDOT is responsible for that activity within TxDOT. So this is a really valuable tool for consultants working for local governments for TxDOT personnel themselves to know, okay, who within TxDOT is supposed to help me with this? You go and see what the color box is and you can find that out. So again, we have these for all of the various phases of the project development process. And in this case, you can see after environmental, it shows here in purple, it leads you, then you can start acquiring right away in utilities. If I go back to the main web page, um, some other things to show you is if you hover over up on the left side, local government projects toolkit, it gives you some flyouts it will allow you to automatically or immediately go directly to, a, to different areas. If we looked under environmental compliance and it tells us there's two other places. So you can go down multiple levels within this website immediately from that file page if you know what you're looking for rather than have to go through page by page to get there. But to show you some of the functionality, I'm gonna to go to the ps &E section. <coughs> Very well with this mouse. 
So as you go to the PSNE part, it has different subtopics, including design requirements for highways and roads, design traffic related areas, bridges and structures, and building facilities, different design requirements. And at the bottom, there's a bullet that talks about bid document preparation. <laughs> and this lists all of the different factors that in putting your bid documents together need to be considered with either federal or state requirements. And you might say, well, what help is that? Down at the bottom of each of these pages, there are three buttons. One is policies, one is procedures, and one is best practices. If you click on those buttons, the policies one takes you to the project, the policy manual, local government projects policy manual, right to the chapter that deals with that specific topic to let you get more information about this topic on putting your bid documents together. If you click on the procedures, it takes you to the same place within the project management guide which gives you information on what the requirements are and what the local government's responsibilities are and what TxDOT's responsibilities are on each of these. And it is still loading, so we'll get there soon later. And on the best practices, it actually takes you to the same section in the project workbook, which is actually a document we encourage you to print out and keep for a project. And as you progress through it, there are check points and places to actually sign off that you've completed certain activities and it has direct links to the forms and other documents. So this is the bid document preparation page within the local government project management guide. And if you go down through here, all of those names, those items that were on that list on the previous page, as an example, here's the bonding requirements. There's a general discussion of the requirements for bonds. There are the required practices. There are the local government's responsibilities and then there's the TxDOT district responsibilities. And so for each item, as we again go through Buy America and others, it goes through for each of those different bullets, it tells you what the requirements are, who's responsible for it. And there are direct links here. Well, somebody says, well, why is Buy America important? And it says, well, because 23 CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations says you have to do it. Well, you can go here and there's a link that takes you directly to 23 CFR so you can read the regulation yourself if you would like to. And then you can go back into the document where you were before. There are also links between the LGP manual, policy manual and the guide. So that if you ever read a question about, well, what are the other regulations that apply to this requirement on your PSE documents, you can get links <coughs> directly into policy manual which has all the links to the external resources that tell you all those requirements. So those are the tools that we have available through this. I have a few more slides to go through and we'll be open to questions and answers. So again, as a reminder that all of the tools are set up to be project development process based so they actually let you follow your way through the project. So if you know what stage you're at, it's easy to find what you're looking for. And we've got the three different documents, the policy manual that again explains why you have to do something, the project management guide that tells you what you need to do, the procedures, and the workbook that's available to help you get forms and tools to help you be, a, be a, to do it successfully. And then we have the flow charts with the swim lanes again that tell you each party's responsibility, where we should be talking to each other, and where TxDOT has approval responsibilities. They have the embedded hyperlinks in them, which take you directly to the applicable federal and state laws and regulations, and also takes you to the TxDOT websites. We have links in there to the design summary report form for a lot of different documents and tools, and tools that are standard TxDOT that we use on our own projects that now are available for local governments to know where to find them. Because if you were local government and didn't even know we had such a form, uh, you wouldn't know that it was a benefit to you to use it on your project. We think because of this, <coughs> clearly giving you access to federal and state laws that apply to the different projects, that it may also be a tool that could be used for people on a non-local LED project, a textile LED project. If you had a question about something and why it had to be done, this might be a resource rather than you having to go find 23 CFR 635.105 that you could go to this document and say, well, it has to do with such and such. It has to do with Buy American. I don't understand why, how I can find that. You can go in here and know that it's under the bid document and you click on it and it takes you directly to that regulation. So we think some of the process, because the process flow on project development process is the same for a TxDOT project versus a local government managed contract. 
However, on the local government contract, they actually have some other local government regulations under state code that don't apply to TxDOT. So it actually makes their job a little bit more complicated than TxDOT doing our own projects with state and federal funds. So on TxDOT or local government projects, the same federal and state laws apply. The toolkit notes when the local government's requirements are different than our requirements to help you understand when the local government requirement takes over. And these tools are available to everybody online. And we do have a requirement for local governments that if they get an agreement with TxDOT to manage certain phases of a project, they actually have to have someone become qualified with TxDOT by taking our 12-hour training class. Our 12-hour training class is now called LGP 101 as of September 1st. It's a former class that was called CON 812, CON 812. Uh, we are currently offering two to three classes per month around the state. They're in many different district locations. I think we actually had them in 10 or 12 different districts last year. And for TxDOT employees, there's no cost for local governments or their consultants. If you have an agreement with TxDOT or you're negotiating an agreement with TxDOT, there's no cost for you or your consultant to take that class either. So we want to make sure people are aware of those and get used to those. There was a link on that website that takes you to the training, and it's also shown down here if you go to local government projects office. And it's under LGPP training to find out how to access and sign up for that. Um, for additional contact information, again, I'm Dave Milliken at the Local Government Project Office. Our information is up there. We have four different people within my organization that are called our project coordinators that have assignments to be the primary points of contact for various districts around the state. Three of them happen to be here. Um, go ahead and stand up. Sharon Williams, John Jameson, and Sonia Ayers. They're here. Many of you probably already know them, and they'll be out to help or work with you on your projects. Um, two other people that we have in our, our office that aren't here today is Tom Nielsen, who's also a local government projects coordinator, and Sam Lawrence, who keeps us organized and keeps all of our tools and everything working together for us. And then we have two other people that aren't part of us anymore, but were key people when they did support us in putting our toolkit together. We have Tom Benz and Martha Juck, who are both in the PEPS area right now, but we want to thank both Martha and Tom for helping us put this toolkit together, along with the others in the room. I now open up for any questions. Am I more than five minutes ahead? Yes, um, young lady in the back yes, with the curly hair. So I have a, uh, just a comment as I inherited one of these jobs, and then I recently got a question as part of a larger audit on what was the procurement for that? And go go find, and we had to show that proof. So it was exactly one of the bullets we pointed out. And I want to thank you and you, your team. Now that I know there's these checklists, I'm going to go catch the project up and, and make sure that the next time I get one of these audit questions about this process, that I'm a little more prepared to, to, to answer that question. Because we didn't have that record. We had to do the scramble to contact, you know, and resurrect history. And I, I think this tool is going to be a great tool to, to, to help us kind of, you know, yes, follow the procedure and the process. And I really appreciate it. I had no idea this resource existed. Well, that's why we're here today. Spread the word a little more. Thank you, Karen. Yes, sir. Uh, the rules and regulations are pretty much the same. The delivery and the approach and the, the tool, we use these tools extensively during the current training class, which didn't exist before. And so it's, the format of it's changed. Um, we think within the next couple of months, currently, once you become qualified to take, by taking the local government projects class, you're qualified for life. Uh, we think in the next couple months, the administration is probably gonna change that to the, you need to retake the class every three years just because our process, our procedures, as well as federal and state laws change sometimes, and so it's good to be refreshed. And if somebody took it in 2009 and hasn't thought about a local government project since then, are they really still qualified? And so right now there is no requirement to retake it, but it, it is, we do try to keep improving the class as we progress. Any other questions? Well, thank you for being here. I'll turn it back over to Charles, I think, for final comments. 